Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be able to be with you guys today. It is an honor to be able to, to share what God has placed in my heart. And this is a word for me. So thank you for being here as I preach this to myself and as I receive what the Lord wants to deposit upon us and upon this house this morning. I have such a sense of urgency. We don't have time. We don't have time to develop a strategic plan that can be implemented in the next year and we can unfold one thing that can build upon another and another. The time is now. And if we lean on God, he will equip us now to do. It is not for us to do in our earthly mindset six months from now, one year from now, because that's what would seem right. Or that's what happened five years ago. That was just a natural progression of things. We are not living in normal times. We are in times that every minute things change radically. And every minute we have to ask God, what are you doing? But today I'm here to declare to you that Jesus is so good. Jesus is so awesome. And he has given us the roadmap of us making our life upon that foundation of the rock, which is to be a doer of his word. We are here listening to the word of God but to be planted and to be upon the rock it's not just coming here and listening to the word of God that's step one it's now going out there and say God I am going to do it may look different it may be scary it may not look like my timetable but the time is now to build upon that rock because if not we are upon that sand and sand moves doesn't matter how beautiful your structure is Yesterday we had a birthday party in our backyard and all of a sudden around 310, it looked like the heavens were just going to pour down. Crazy wind started blowing. At that point, everybody ran to the backyard, bringing everything that was not anchored into the rock. Even those pop-up tents that had like those little anchors that you put on the side, that wasn't enough. That was going to blow away in the middle of that storm. Because the only thing that will stay, that will stay firm when the wind blows, when the storm comes, when you're upon the rock of Jesus because upon that sand, we are constantly then in this war of decisions. What is right? What is not right? Who am I supposed to please today? How do I make everybody happy around me? What does it mean to be a Christian in 2022? Well, it doesn't change. The word of God does not change. But that's when you are upon that rock being a doer, being a doer. If you can go with me to Psalms 83. Psalms 83. In the name of Jesus, spirit of confusion needs to go, needs to go because upon that rock, we, there is no confusion, no error, no room for that. Um, I'm going to read this passage from the ICB version. God, do not keep quiet. God, do not be silent or still. Your enemies are making plans. Those who hate you are getting ready to attack. They are making plans against your people. They plan to hurt those you love. They say, come, let's destroy them as a nation. Then no one will remember the name of Israel anymore. We are living in this time that the war that is being waged against us, it's not a personal thing. It's not a you thing. It's not a me thing it's they're coming against the kingdom of God and we need to recognize that is the war that we're in right now but God does speak and if we don't hear him then we need to ask him Lord I need to hear your voice I remember years ago when I was like 14 or 15 years old in youth group they had this amazing idea of showing us the movie left behind I don't know if anybody ever saw like the original of that well that was not good that caused such fear in my life, not fear to pursue the presence of God, but I remember in the house when I didn't see like my mom around, this is 13, 14, 15 years old, like I'm not a little kid at this point. And I would like, mom, are you there? Because in my mind, oh my goodness, maybe the rapture already came. Maybe I was left behind, you know, but I know my mom prays a lot. I know that she's like, she's for real. So, you know, if she's there, like what's happening? But when I would hear her voice, that brought such peace 
my thoughts that were spiraling out of control, that were going like from one to two to three at that moment, it stopped when I heard her voice. So when we hear the voice of God, it brings that peace. It brings that confidence. But we need to ask and call out, God, I need to hear you right now. God, I need to hear you right now. I need you at this present moment. Remind me that I have not been forgotten. Remind me of that. When we can't hear God speaking, maybe it's we need to lean into that. You know, if I try right now to talk, everybody's talking and I don't have a microphone. I'm talking across the room. It's super difficult to hear the person on the other side. Super difficult. I need to physically get close to them. I need to physically get in a place that the proximity will allow me to be able to hear. But leaning into God is more than proximity. Leaning into God is also a time factor. Anybody ever tried to have a deep conversation with somebody and you only have five minutes and you were on the clock? How did that work out for you? How did that work out when you were on the receiving end or on the giving end? Either you got nowhere or you just went for it and that just exploded into something different because you didn't allow the time for it to develop and for it to go where it needed to go. Leaning on God requires us to give the king of kings the time, the space. We don't rush him. It's waiting upon him and saying, God, I am here, and I'm going to stay here until I hear your voice, until I am deposited with that that I need in this day. Because when God speaks, I promise you that then you can activate that promise that says that the steps of the righteous are ordained by God, that I have no error. So things in your life that you had to do that day that you thought you didn't have time, when you give the time to God and you lean on him and you wait, he will make it all come to pass because you are not doing it three different ways to figure out the right way. You are not constantly in that turmoil because he will deposit that wisdom that only he can do when you need to hear him you call to him you lean into him and you need to eliminate distraction and noise a couple of months ago we went to dallas not dallas fort worth we went to like a college football game great seats super nice we were having great conversation the people that were there and then the game started we were physically right next to each other we could not hear anything and then when we sat, there was like amazing end zone. There was this big contraption that every time something good happened, it was like this bullhorn just like blaring that there was no way that you can hear anything. But I was positioned next to the person. But where I was is not where I needed to be to be able to hear. I physically had to go somewhere else. That reminds me of when Peniel takes place. That sometimes God has to take us to the place it's just us and him and that encounter, that encounter that you say, I am not moving, Lord, from this place of intimacy with you on this one-on-one -on -one until you bless me. I am not moving. Sometimes that position is actually gathering together where the word of God says that when two or three come together in his name that he is there so what does this look like in your life you need to ask him you need to ask him but that shift of position sometimes needs to take place so the noise can be eliminated some I couldn't make them stop shouting or having that bullhorn blaring but I physically was able to hey can we go take a walk and we go, and then that way we continue our conversation. I had to move away from that noise. And there's so much noise taking place right now. So much noise all over the place. We need to shut it off. We need to move away from it and stop blaming. Well, they need to stop. Well, they need to get it together. We can't control them. But we can say, Lord, where do you want me? I'm going to shift. I'm going to move. I'm going to do what you want me to do. Sometimes when we can't hear him and we need to hear him. It's this word that sometimes has a bad connotation, but it's a beautiful word. It's called repent. Sometimes there is sin in our life still sitting there. 
And when we're in times of worship, or now as you're hearing the word, God will bring things to your memory. Don't disregard it. Repent and say, God, I am sorry. I am sorry, but you are so merciful. Your loving kindness endures forever. That you forgive me. You accept me. And I can now enter into right standing with you, Lord into right standing repentance is a beautiful thing because in that we see the love of the father in that we see what the power of the blood of jesus did what that cross represents it doesn't represent the need to be perfect it represents that we can ask for forgiveness and god then will forgive us that's what that beautiful cross means if you can go with me to luke 17 In Luke 17, verse 31, it says, In that day who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. God is speaking. We need to speak because our Father speaks. When God says to move, we need to move immediately. Not turning back. Seeing what was left. Seeing what it was like. The goodness of God is real. And the goodness of God is for today. It's for tomorrow, for the day after. And it's that moving forward. And when he says to go, we need to just obey and run and go. Here it referenced Lot's wife. God said, just go. But she stopped and she looked back. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. She just looked for a second. Well, I think it was more than that. I think her heart was telling her, wait, I'm leaving behind my kids. How am I going to do that? I can't do that. I'm leaving behind my, where I grew up, my comfortable place. I'm leaving behind all my memories, everything that was so dear to me. Why, why am I going this way? I need to go back to what felt comfortable, to what was my safe place. But God was saying, I'm sparing you. This plan is to protect you. This plan is to save your life. This plan is to give you a future. Uh, that needs to be destroyed. Can you just trust me and move forward in that? Because we want to hold on to even the blessing and that turns into our God. But God is God. There's only one true God. We were declaring him alone. Everything else, we need to be willing to just give it up. There in Luke 18, it continues with examples of what it looks like to really need God versus, I'm okay. I'm holding on. I have it all together. It starts there with this example of a Pharisee. They're, they're praying. And this tax collector is seen as like the worst of the worst. And the Pharisee's prayer is like, God, thank you that I'm not like him. Thank you that I'm so good, that I'm not a sinner like that. And then the tax collector's prayer is, I am so sorry. I am a sinner. Be merciful to me, Lord. Where are we? Who are we right now? Who is God calling us to be? Are we the one? I am so good. I, I think I'm doing a good job right now being a Christian. I think I'm checking off the boxes. I'm good. I'm not like dumb, so I, I guess I'm really good. Or do we come to God every day knowing that we mess up? We are not. Our thoughts, if there will be a movie and right now projecting every thought that goes through our minds, not good. Let's be real. And God sees it all. So we can't hold on thinking I'm holding on because I'm protecting something. We need to let it go and give it to God. In that chapter, it goes on that kids were trying to come to Jesus. And people were rebuking, hey, no, don't bother him. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Let the little ones come. You need to be like them. How are little ones? Are they embarrassed to ask you for something? Or do they run up and say, I need food. I'm hungry. I want that. Yesterday, Sammy and I'm like, this is embarrassing when people would come in. Where's my gift? But, but that's what kids do. They express what's in their heart and what they want. They don't try to like shelter it and like what's the politically correct thing to do right now and how do I say this? They just do it. 
When the last kid left our house, she ran to me. Mommy, all the kids are gone. Oh, Abby, oh, Sammy, okay. It's okay. No, no, we can open our gifts now. Like, again, she's just expressing, expressing. When did we stop being kids with God? When did we stop just talking to our father and telling him what's in our heart and telling him, Dad, this stinks. I don't know what to do right now. I need you. Or, Dad, I really want to do this, but what lo it looks like such a giant in front. Even what just took place of Roe versus Wade. Okay, that, but what about now the 50 states? Because now it's up to the states. And what about now everything else? Those are huge giants. What? I forget it. What about when did we stop becoming that child that can just go to the father and say whatever? Or just come and give hugs and say, I just wanted to hug you for a second. And now we got it all together. In Luke 18, that it continues to talk about this man that comes to Jesus Telling Jesus what a great Jew he is. He has kept all the laws. He has it. He's so good. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. Like if Jesus was going to give him like a badge of honor. Finally, you got here. I was waiting for you to come and follow me. He really was expecting that to happen. You're here. Awesome. Because you check off all the boxes. No. Jesus looked at him and said, okay. You're rich, right? Rich young ruler. Okay, rich. Sell everything and come follow me. Come. Oh. Okay, Jesus. Uh, that's too much to ask. Because, hey, when you have a nice bank account, there's security there. Your future's taken care of. You don't have to be doing this faith thing. You can just be confident in what you have done. Again, going back to what Luke 17 talked about. Are we trying to save our life? We can't, we don't know what the stock market's going to look like tomorrow. We don't know what the gas prices are going to look two weeks from now. But when God's our provider, when he's the one that protects us, when he has our tomorrow, it's okay. We can look at those prices and say, ha, huh, I wonder what's going to happen. But it's okay. My heavenly father's in control. Amen. He's in control. There it continues to tell about this blind man. That Jesus was coming by and he started, he heard Jesus is coming. He started crying out to Jesus and people didn't want him to call out. That was like annoying them. That's not the thing to do. Do I protect myself? You know, my, at, least my, at least I have my reputation. I'm blind, but at least I have my reputation. Let me listen to the people that are my friends around me. Or do I just give it all up and cry out? It says he cried out even louder even louder, that Jesus saw him. Jesus saw him. Jesus heard him. Jesus healed him, gave him the miracle that nobody else was able to give him because that's who Jesus is. And you see all these umbrellas I have around here. It's not that we all left them over the weekend. When we choose Jesus and we choose to give it all up to Jesus, we're under his protection. We're walking like this. Doesn't matter what's happening to my right or to my left. I'm under his protection. And if we can go to Psalm 91, that reminds me of what that protection looks like. <clears throat> Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Are you able to abide? Can you say, God, I will just give it all for you? Because here, Amen. here I can be protected. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. We all trust something or somebody. Today can we trust God? Can we put our trust in him? Because if we're real, we're trusting something or the other. Can we choose to trust him so we can abide under the shadow of the Almighty? No matter what comes, we are protected by him.
Surely he shall deliver you from the snare, the fowler, and the perilous pestilence. Doesn't matter what disease comes. Doesn't matter what the friend calls you and says, oh, they diagnosed this and this over me. You tell your mind right now, I take every thought captive to the obedience of the word of God. They were diagnosed with X, Y, and Z. Oh, God, but I am your child right now. I abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and I pray divine healing upon myself. And you don't let that come in because when you are under his protection, this is your promise. He shall cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Ever seen a mama duck with its babies when it's raining outside? She has them covered. She's found a place under a tree, under somewhere protected. But she is taking it all in, but those babies are protected. She is going to do whatever it takes. Have you ever tried to take a ducky away from a mama? Oh, my goodness. She is going to chase you down because that is her baby. Your heavenly father is your protector, and he will chase down whatever to come to your rescue. You shall not be afraid of the terror of night. Fear, go in the name of Jesus, nor of arrows that fly by day. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. God is for you when you are under his protection. When you say, I stop choosing to protect myself. I choose to be under your protection, God. I choose to abide here, Lord. I choose you. I choose you, Lord. Can you go to verse 6? Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noon. Whatever report comes, whatever pop-up shows up on your phone, God is greater. He is greater. Whatever your kid turns to you and says, I think this is the new truth, God is greater. Whatever grandchild says, this is my reality. Oh, you go to your secret place and you say, oh, but the truth of God is greater. And I will see his goodness in the land of the living. What does that mean? That your eyes will see the work of God. A thousand may fall to my right and ten thousand to my left, but it shall not come near you. The amount does not scare you in the name of Jesus because God's the one that's having to fight that. It's not you fighting that. It's you just obeying your father. He will fight that battle for you. If it's one, 10,000, it's okay. God tells me to move. I'll move because he's going before me, opening the way, doing what needs to be done, what needs to be done as I abide under him. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Not only put a guard over my mouth, God, put a guard over my eyes that I may stay focused on you. And when I look, it's to see the victory. I am not going to look at the 10,000 coming. I'm going to look to you because you know if you look at the 10,000, what's going to happen? A little shaking is going to take place, right? It's going to look a little scary. But no, God, I look to you. I look to you, I abide under, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. He is your place. What does your father say about you? Go to Luke 18. We referenced a bunch of stuff in there, but I want us to read something in Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 7. This is after Jesus is doing a parable about this persistent lady. Anybody know anybody persistent? Anybody in here persistent? She needed something. She was a widow. Widows had like no rights back then. And she needed somebody to stand for her. So she goes to this judge. He doesn't love God. He doesn't know God. He doesn't care about God. But he was merciful and graceful. Not because of love and kindness, because he was tired of this person coming to him again and again. But then Jesus says, hold on, perspective here, perspective. Verse 7, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? 
Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. The Lord calls you elect. You are chosen. You have been chosen by him. Yes, we make the decision for him, but he first chose us. So whoever in your life told you that you are not worthy, that you are not worth the time, that you, that is not what God says about you. That is not who Jesus says you are. Go to Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. If you can come on up, Chris, as we close this off. Ephesians 3, sorry, Ephesians 1, verse 3. I need you to remember, I can choose to abide. I can choose to abide because I need to know as I abide, how do I stay here? I need to be reminded who Jesus says I am, the true you. Not the you that the culture says you are. Not the you that your parents told you you are. Not the you that your spouse or ex-husband told you that you are. Not the you that your friend told you that you are. But who are you? This is who Jesus says that you are. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You are blessed with every blessing. You are blessed. Say it right there. I am blessed. I am blessed. This is who you are. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and without blame before for him he chose you you are chosen you are chosen not rejected you have been chosen you are holy set apart for him that's why you don't fit in certain realms you're not supposed to you're supposed to fit in with him that's where you're supposed to fit in so you're not fitting in an x y and z place it's not because there's something wrong with you, but because there's something right with you. Because you are child of God. You are chosen. You are wholly separated for him. And that's where you belong. That's where you go. So when you go and you come and you join your brothers and sisters and something inside of you feels like, oh, I feel, I feel God because that's where he needs you. He needs you here. This is where you fit. Having predestined us to adoption of sons but by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, you are adopted. Anybody met somebody that adopted or has been adopted? Somebody that's adopted. Man, I love hearing their story. They prayed for that kid. They yearned for that kid. They went out and they picked him or her. When they got that phone call, it was the best day of their life. They ran. They were getting a baby. They were getting a kid. They were chosen. So it's not just that you happened and God says, oh, I guess they can be my child. He adopted you. He sought you out. He picked you. He has he wants you. He wants that relationship. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Say I am accepted. No strings attached here. Accepted the way that you are. He says you are mine. Accepted not because what you can bring to the table think god says be like kids bring them to me does any business just market to the kids no they market to the parents when they say free food night tuesday it's not because they love kids and they want their house to be packed with kids to give them free food why are they doing that they want the parent that's going to pay now for the one two other meals and i guess the kid will be that marketing tool we're not a marketing tool for god we are a marketing tool. He wants us for who we are, for who we are right now. That's who he wants us, who we are. Verse 7, in him we have redemption. We are redeemed. The price has been paid. The ticket, 
the ticket for your life. The cross gave that ticket. We are redeemed through the blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace. We are forgiven. When the enemy says, but look at your past, but it's you can't do that. Somebody else can do that. They're more qualified than you. They have a better lineage than you. They, they should be the one. But I've been forgiven. Forgiveness means blank slate moving forward. My father has accepted me. My father has adopted me. My father has redeemed me, forgiven me. Verse 8, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure with he purposed in him. You are wise. Don't believe the lie of the enemy that you do not have access to the spirit of discernment. Don't believe the lie of the enemy that you make mistakes and you don't know the right thing to do. And you need to always figure, let somebody else make the decisions. The promise, he says you are wise when you abide. When you abide, when you are under him, this is who you are. You are wise. You are wise. There is no error in you in the name of Jesus. You are wise. Verse 10, I love that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all the things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Jesus has not abandoned us. He is coming back for us. It is not equipping us here to figure it out. There is promise that we're going to be reunited again. He has not abandoned us. He in him also we have obtained an inheritance. The inheritance comes from our heavenly father. The inheritance is beautiful, but we need to abide. Abide in him, knowing that he will fill us with the words to speak. But the time is now as I started such a sense of urgency we can all just stand up the time is now to stand to move where he wants us to go the time is now to be able to stand strong no matter who we think is with us if God is with us we can move forward he is so great so as we go right now into a worship song just talk right there to your heavenly father. If you need to take out Ephesians 1 and start declaring that over yourself, God, thank you for reminding me that I am blessed. I am blessed by you. I am not rejected. I am accepted. I am set apart from you. I am chosen, Lord. Declare these things over your life right now. 